Hi everyone, today I'm going to walk you through a brief history of young adult literature. Um, this isn't meant to be completely comprehensive, but it's just supposed to give you an overview of some of the highlights of how young adult literature came into being and um, the process of getting to where we are now with a great deal of young adult books and it being a very popular and well-liked genre. So to do that, I'm going to share my screen with you. That way you can see my PowerPoint. All right, so this is, this is from um, some lectures and seminars that I've attended, um, classes that I've taken in college, as well as my own research and information that I've gathered. Um, I also put a few resources in here for you as well, uh, which you may want to look at if you have the chance. All right, so people debate when young adult literature or YA lit actually started and which books are considered YA. If Louisa May Alcott's Little Women is a young adult book, it would be one of the earliest. It was published in 1869. Some readers consider this novel a children's book, but the main characters begin the novel as 16, 15, 13, and 12, and about 10 years pass over the course of the novel. So you do have two characters who start out as, of oh, three characters who start out as teenagers, and you go through a pretty significant period in their life. Just as an aside, there is sometimes a great deal of overlap between what's considered children's literature and what's considered young adult literature. So sometimes that line is kind of blurry. Uh, some of the books that I mentioned are considered more children's literature, and then sometimes it depends on who's reading it and what their opinion is. The novel also deals with relevant young adult themes, particularly growing up, and the title Little Women is even supposed to refer to the period between being a child and being a young woman in a girl's lifetime. So you're not a full adult, but you're a little woman, hence the title. All right, so if you're in my class, um, I'm gonna ask you to read the first chapter of Little Women and see if you'd consider it a young adult book. I put the link to Project Gutenberg right over here. That way you can read it. It is in the public domain. And if you choose to read more than the first chapter, that would be wonderful too. Um, but take a few moments, read. I'm gonna ask you to pause me and then when you've finish reading that first chapter, you can play again. All right, and whether you think Little Women is young adult or not, is gonna depend on your opinion and what you think of that first chapter. And if you were to read further on, of course, you'd have even more insight. Other old young adult books. So this is really before we start labeling the genre young adult. Um, and classifying books as young adult, but these are kind of between that line of some of them would be more children's literature, some of them are between the line, some of them are young adult, but not always classified as such. So see what you think. Here's some other early novels that could be YA. Um, all of these are already considered classics of children liter children's literature. So Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, published in 1877. Frances Hawks and Burnett's A Little Princess is published in 1905. Ellen Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables is published in 1908, and Frances Hawks and Burnett's The Secret Garden is published in 1911. I would say that Anne is the most clearly YA protagonist of the books mentioned on this slide. She starts the book at age 11, but the story ends when she's 16, so it goes all through her growing up, and there are sequels that follow that first book, and those uh, follow her as she grows, and uh, follow her until she's an adult. And I think perhaps even uh, beyond that. All right, so now we're getting into the books that are definitely considered YA. This is when we start to see YA as a genre and people start to classify it and like put it on a shelf as young adult books specifically. So renowned YA librarian, Margaret A. Edwards said that the first YA book published was Helen Bollyson's novel, Sue Barton, Student Nurse, published in 1936. Others say that the first YA book is Maureen Daly's 17th Summer, published in 1942. That book inspires a lot of teenage love stories, especially in the 1940s. Other people say that it was S.D. E. Hinton's The Outsiders, published in 1967. Of these three, The Outsiders is definitely the most well-known and perhaps well-respected of these books. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, YA starts to come about as a genre and be classified as YA in the 30s and 40s. So I asked why this time period. Before the 1930s, children went directly into adulthood with little transition when they started their first job. In the 1930s, the Great Depression forced many teenagers to stay in school since they could not find work. So 
before the 1930s, you'd kind of be a child and then you'd get thrown into the workforce and you would have to figure out all of your responsibilities, what you had to do, all of these things in a pretty quick amount of time. In the 1930s, because the Great Depression really hinders our economy, um, many teenagers have to stay in school since they can't work, and it creates this kind of transition period between being a child and then being an adult, and you sort of have a mix of responsibilities. You're figuring out how to grow up, um, what you want to do to come of age. In the 1940s, other genres of YA literature appear, such as sports novels, science fiction, book of, books about cars, animals, action adventure, and careers. So you start to have different genres within YA. Romance stories set in idealized small towns and that focus on first dates, first dates, true love, and the junior problem were very popular in the 1940s and 50s. So those are kind of more lighthearted, sometimes frivolous stories. Um, they're not always hit, they're not always talking about really hard hitting issues or difficult subjects. But then what happens is S.E. Hinton publishes The Outsiders in 1967 and it becomes something that's very um, realistic and even a little bit gritty at times. So again, my students, I'm gonna ask you to read the first chapter and to pause me. Um, I'll post the link to that first chapter on Google Classroom and I'll actually post it within this PowerPoint. So if you go to the PowerPoint and then you go to this slide, instead of I'll post the link on Google Classroom, you'll see the actual link and you can just click on it for yourself. So I'll give you a few minutes to read that. And then I'll ask again, how does this fit the definition of young adult literature? And how is this chapter different from the excerpt from Little Women? So you may say that it's a little more gritty. Um, it may talk about more contemporary issues. Um, and it may talk about more serious issues, um, talking about characters with difficult home lives, uh, social classes, how teenagers interact with each other, even though uh, characters in Little Women are, of course, dealing with their own particular conflicts and coming of age. So The Outsiders also starts a lot of trends that we see in more modern young adult literature. So S.E. Hinton uses these key features and a lot of other YA authors borrow from that tradition. So she writes in first person, uh, Outsiders is told from Ponyboy's perspective and he uses I, he's telling you his story himself. A lot of other characters do that. Even in uh, very recent years, there's a lot of books where you have two alternating perspectives, but they're told in first person. So I may tell you a chapter from my point of view, and then my best friend may tell you a chapter from his or her point of view. You also see a modern urban or city setting, and you get an exploration of new and relevant social issues. So The Outsiders touches on gangs, on uh, social classes, on cliques within high school, um, talks about you know trying to find meaning. All of those things are pretty deep and relevant social issues. Also talks about wealth, status, all of that. Other authors also use realistic fiction like Essie Hinton did to explore YA problems. So realistic fiction is fiction that you could see happening in the real world even though it's an invented story. Hinton herself wrote, the world is changing, yet the authors of books for teenagers are still 15 years behind the times. In the fiction they write, romance is still the most popular theme, with the horse and the girl who loved it coming in a close second. Nowhere is the drive-in social jungle men mentioned. In short, where is the reality? So drive-in movie theaters were very popular in the 60s when Essie Hinton was herself a teenager. So she's asking where are the, the relevant and modern settings in young adult literature. Um, she also talks about how you just have these light romances and there's not really those deep issues. I always ask my students, why is writing 15 years behind the times a problem, especially for YA literature? If you think about it, what happened 15 years ago to teenagers is going to be very different from what's going on for teenagers now. Um, you didn't have quite the same social media presence or importance. Um, a lot of our social conventions change for teenagers. So what I read when I was a young adult and was relevant to me is going to be different than what my students read as young adults and what's relevant for them right now. Um, of course, you have universal themes, but a lot of things change and it does make a big difference if you have 15 years, um, if you're 15 years behind the time for young adult lit. 
Okay. A little bit before The Outsiders is published in 1951, J.D. Salinger publishes The Catcher in the Rye. Um, I didn't put this before The Outsiders because this is a little more debatable. Some people say that it's not young adult, other people say that it is. So J.D. Salinger publishes it for adults, but young adults gravitate towards it and it's very popular with young adults. Um, the main character is a young adult himself, but it wasn't intended for young adult audiences originally. If The Catcher in the Rye were published today, it would most likely be published as a young adult novel. Uh, the Catcher in the Rye also influences a lot of other YA books and authors. So John Green, author of The Fault in Our Stars and Turtles All the Way Down, as well as many other YA books, loves The Catcher in the Rye. There's actually a picture of him talking about it um, from PBS's The Great American Read, I think this was. Um, but it's really something that's influenced him and that he really enjoyed as a teenager himself. So interesting to see uh, patterns. I also am including this little link to the vi this video that shows you the evolution of YA. It's very short and condensed, but it has really helpful infographics and it gives you a lot of information. Um, it's a great resource to use and to watch. Again, I would ask my students to pause me at this point in time and to watch that. Okay. So in the 1970s, we get the first golden age of YA literature, woohoo. Robert Cormier publishes The Chocolate War in 1974 and challenges the idea of happy endings in YA. Before that point, you had a lot of YA books that even if they had difficult problems, would end very happily and on a positive note. That's not the case with The Chocolate War and it sort of breaks that convention. I listed a bunch of other very popular authors in the 1970s for you here. Some of them you may be familiar with. Also, after the civil rights movement in the 1960s, African-American authors write about African-Americans in young adult literature. Um, authors include Rosa Guy, Walter Dean Myers, Julius Lester, Alice Childress, Virginia Hamilton, and Mildred Taylor, among others. So that's a really key feature of golden age of Y literature in the 70s. And we start to see more diversity. Okay, so other people, critics, uh, people who study YA ask if the 1970s literature continues its golden age. The problem novel also becomes popular in the 1970s. Problem novels are about real issues, parental divorce, teenage pregnancy, abortion, drug or alcohol abuse, but they are just driven by the plot and therefore contain underdeveloped characters. These problem novels tend to lack literary merit and style and are usually preachy and just try to teach a lesson. So they're very moralistic. They talk about a problem. The characters may not always be that interesting or fully fleshed out. And it's really just about that problem. Um, and it tries to give you some sort of like a lesson or a moral to it. Um, it's usually not regarded very highly by literary critics. The 1980s, some things changed. Readers lose interest in problem novels and there is a re revival of romance usually appearing in series like Sweet Valley High. Paperback books become very popular. These novels, paperbacks, and, and also romance novels as well, were not always well respected. And by the end of the 1980s, many believe that YA literature is near death. New writers who emerged and were well respected included Bruce Brooks, Francesca Leah Block, Brock Cole, Chris Crutcher, Cynthia Voigt, Ron Coderidge, Virginia Ewer Wolf, and others. So again, we see some overall trends, but you still have some standout authors who are maybe not following all these trends um, or who managed to do so still with a great deal of merit, just for you to know. All right, 1990s, YA literature is alive and well again. Um, this is one of my favorite parts, uh, the slide after this, because I can actually say that I lived through this period of YA literature. Horror became popular. Crossover books, whose potential audience can be as old as 25, appeared. This is something that's really popular even now, is a young adult book that older readers will gravitate towards. Um, we actually even have a new genre, it's called new adult, which is for that age that's slightly over young adult, maybe young adults can read it, um, but it's for a little bit older of a target audience. I gave you guys some more uh, key authors in here to look at, and you also have even more YA genres that come about. You have nonfiction, 
poetry, short stories, graphic novels, picture books, um, but YA picture books, so not targeted at children, but targeted at young adults, all grow and become very popular. So 1990s to the present is actually considered the second golden age of YA, which is quite a long golden age to have, hooray. So future historians, um, this is according to this book, uh, I gave you the author's name, Cart, right here. Future literary historians, I'm convinced, will view the 1990s as one of the most significant and breathtakingly dramatic decades in the history of young adult literature. So, like I said, this is the part that I lived through. Hooray. In 1999, the Michael L. Prince Award was established. It identifies YA books with literary excellence. So these are very well respected and books that are regarded as very well written, um, and there's an award to commemorate them. So I gave you a link, uh, American Library Association has a list of all of these books if you'd like to look at that. Um, hopefully you'll find something interesting and maybe inspired to read it. Okay, so for this more modern period, I'm gonna put together some key books, authors, and publication dates. There's several parts to this. So in 1993, Lois Lowry publishes The Giver. That's a dystopia, so a book about a world where things go very wrong. Um, the utopia is uh, this concept of a world where everything is perfect and beautiful. Um, it comes from Sir Thomas More, and the word actually means uh, utopia is place, and then you means no. So his idea was that no place could really be a utopia. Well, one of his ideas, but that's kind of the concept behind it, that it doesn't exist yet, this utopia perfect society. So a dystopia is the opposite of that. It's a world where things go really, really wrong. Um, Sarah Dessen publishes That Summer in 1996. It's her first published novel, and she's a very prolific young adult literature author. Uh, one of my favorites, Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine, is published in 1997. Also in 1997, J.K. Rowling publishes Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. That's the first in the series. This is also one of the first YA series, or any series, to have a protagonist who grows up along with his readers. This novel is both a children's book and a work of YA literature, and it also has a lot of that crossover appeal. So many adults would read this book. Part of that starts as parents just reading Harry Potter to their children, but another part of it is that adults were just interested in this story and in this phenomenon. Um, and perhaps that's what made it a phenomenon to begin with. So, Harry begins the book at age 11, 10, and then he ends the books at age 17. And then of course there's a, there's a flash forward, maybe 20s older at the end of the book. So something to keep in mind. With other series, you had a character who stayed the same age, but just had a lot of adventures or stories to tell within that you know couple of years. Harry Potter really grows up with his readers. He gets one year older in every installment. Uh, Monster by Walter Dean Myers, fantastic book, uh, published in 1999. J.K. Rowling publishes Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix in 2003. It's the fifth book in the series, but I wanted to mention it because it's usually considered the turning point to definitely being YA in the series. Uh, there's a lot of angst and yelling and dealing with very difficult emotions, um, which is, of course, the cause of all of that angst. But it's one of the books that stands out in the series because it kind of shifts it from more children's book to more YA. Sarah Destin's The Truth About Forever Ever is published in 2004. Rick Warden's Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief is published in 2005. That's the first in that series and any series about Percy Jackson. There are other um, companion series that follow that as well. John Green publishes Looking for Alaska in 2005. That's his first published novel. Um, he's another very prolific, well-respected young adult author. Okay, some more for you. Jean Lewin Yang's American Born Chinese is published in 2006. It's a graphic novel um, and it does deal a lot with uh, your ethnicity and your identity and your main characters really struggling to find where they fit in if they can sort of reconcile, um, you know, being Chinese and being American. And it's a really interesting read because not only is, does it have all those issues, but it's also a graphic novel um, that's very compelling. Cassandra Clare's The Mortal Instruments, City of Bones, is published in March 2007. That's the first in that series. Um, Sharon, the Mortal Instruments series. 
Sharon G. Flakes, uh, Who Am I Without Him? Short Stories About Boys, About Girls, and the Boys in Their Lives, published July 17th, 2007. J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows is published July 21st, 2007. This is the last in this series, unless you count the later play, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. The last film, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two, came out in 2011. Um, to give you an idea of how a character growing with their, their readers kind of works, when I went to see the first Harry Potter movie, my mom took me to the movie theater and drove me and then when I went to see the last Harry Potter movie, that was my first time driving my friends in my car alone at night. Um, so you can kind of see that your, your characters come of age along with the reader, which was a really unique phenomenon. Okay, um, 2007 has a lot going on in it. Um, I wanted to mention some specific dates, so I put either a month or a date that the book was released, just so you can kind of see um, I guess the Harry Potter impact that it was a series, a lot of series became very popular at this time. And also the fact that you had a really large fan base. So a lot of people loved Harry Potter, grew up with Harry Potter, and they're kind of looking for a new book, most likely gonna be YA because a lot of them were young adults when they finished reading, um, but they're looking for a new book or a new series to gravitate towards after that. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you guys the opening lines of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And think about how the tone differs, how the information provided is different, and why would the same author writing the same series use different techniques to start different books. So this is the first line of the first book. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. And then this is the first line of the last book. The two men appeared out of nowhere, a few yards apart in the narrow moonlit lane. For a second, they stood quite still, wands directed at each other's chests. Then recognizing each other, they stowed their wands beneath their cloaks and started walking briskly in the same direction. So I'll let you think about those differences in tone and subject matter, um, even in writing style, and just think about why that would change so much from beginning to end of the series. All right, some more next golden age of YA, 1990s is the present publication dates. So Stephanie Meyer's Twilight comes out in August 2007. It's the first in that series that starts the trend of teen paranormal romance. Uh, why would the publication date of this book help it gain an audience? I kind of answered that for you a little bit ago, but after the Harry Potter series, you have a lot of young adults who are waiting for another book or another series to start, so it kind of comes out at an opportune time. Stephanie Meyer's Breaking Dawn is published in August 2008, the last in that series. Um, Again, you kind of see that there's a little bit of a smooth timeline here. Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games, published in September 2008, first in the trilogy, begins the recent trend of YA dystopia. So kind of like Lois Lowry's The Giver, you have a world where things are very wrong, um, and it revives that dystopian trend. Rick Rorden's Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Last Olympian, is published in 2009, and that's the last in the first series related to Percy Jackson. Okay, so a lot of people have wondered why there's so much science fiction and fantasy and dystopia in young adult literature. So I put a link to this really fascinating article, Ashley Strickland's A Brief History of Young Adult Literature. So um, this is what she has to say about the, the fantasy dystopia uh, sci-fi trend. A book would begin marketing directly to teens for the first time at the turn of the millennium. Expansive young adult sections appeared in bookstores targeting and welcoming teens to discover their very own genre. J.K. Rowling's well-timed Harry Potter series exploded the category and inspired a whole generation of fantasy series novelists, Karp said. The shift led to success for Stephanie Meyer's Twilight, Vampire Saga, and Suzanne Collins' Futuristic The Hunger Games. But why do paranormal, uh, paranormal and dystopian tales connect so well with teens? Just like adolescence is between childhood and adulthood, Paranormal or Other is Between Human and Supernatural, said Jennifer Lynn Barnes, a young adult author, PhD, and cognitive science scholar. Teens are caught between two worlds, childhood and adulthood, and in YA, they can navigate those two worlds and sometimes dualities of other worlds. So in other words, because 
as a young adult reader, you're stuck between being a child and being an adult, you may gravitate towards stories where a character is stuck between two worlds of their own, like, you know, the, the wizarding world and the muggle world, or the vampire world and the regular world of Forks High School. Okay, um, so there's a part five to this. Uh, Suzanne Collins' Mockingjay is published in 2010, last in the trilogy. Um, this year, actually, uh, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was published as a prequel to that series. Veronica Roth's Divergent is published in April 2011. So again, you can kind of see a year after one very popular YA series ends, there's another popular YA series that sort of begins. Um, I thought it was very interesting. Veronica Roth's fascina fascination with sorting characters into factions stem from the Harry Potter series and the Four Houses of Hogwarts. Um, so I think it's really interesting to kind of follow how books influence each other. So just like The Catcher in the Rye influenced John Green's writing, you can kind of see that the Harry Potter series influences Veronica Roth, which of course influences Divergent and that whole Divergent series. Ransom Riggs, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children is published in June 2011. Um, and it's another book that is unique for its format as well. So it combines um, photographs with, with text and a narrative. John Green's Ar The Fault in Our Stars is published in January 2012. Kira Cass is the selection in April 2012. Um, if you'd like to listen, my class, you don't have to listen to this, but if you would like to, uh, John Green actually reads the first chapter of The Fault in Our Stars. Um, he spends the first minute and 11 seconds talking about um, just a little like intro to the video. So if you wanted to start where the first chapter starts, um, I'd suggest starting there. If you want to pause me, you can. And if not, we're going to keep going. So a few more publication dates. Um, I just did this up until more recent years. There's some books that I haven't mentioned on here, but I'm sure you can think of a lot more recent YA books that should be on this list as well. Sarah J. Moss's The Throne of Glass, Veronica Roth's Four, A Divergent Collection, uh, Victoria Aviard's Red Queen, Nicola Yoon's Everything, Everything, and of course, like I said, you can think of many more that come after that. So my students, I'm gonna give you a timeline to fill in based on this information. You'll have a copy of this whole PowerPoint presentation in Google Classroom, so you can fill in those publication dates by going through and looking back at this video and back at that PowerPoint. All right, so some very recent young adult literature trends. So these are things that we see a lot of right now. A Girl Who Changes the World, Own Voices. Um, that's also a trend in generic literature that's not always YA. When an author writes about a culture that they belong to, so for instance, since I'm Italian American, if I wrote a book about Italian American lifestyle, that, that would be considered an Own Voices story. Women scientists, so that's a nonfiction trend. A lot of books about the, the lives and the, the doings and the discoveries of women scientists, um, think like Madame Curie. Justice and equality. Mental illness. Um, there have been books published about mental illness in the YA genre before, but the focus has kind of shifted. So in more modern YA books, a character has a mental illness, but the novel is not necessarily about the character's mental illness. So they may have OCD, but they're not just dealing with OCD, they're dealing with other issues as well. And that's just a part of their life and their personality and the things that they are dealing with. Um, you also have a lot of LGBTQ plus novels. Um, it's also a part of the character, but it's not always the basis of the plot. So that may be, again, something that a character is dealing with, something that's a key part of that character's personality, but it's not always the only focus of the book. Um, you also have a lot of survival stories about living through disasters. A subgenre of that is refugees and immigration and that experience. You'll also notice, especially based on those uh, trends in the previous slide, that there's a lot of variety in YA literature. So there's a lot of different genres, tones, and lengths of YA books. There's also diverse authors writing about different experiences um, and a lot of people writing about different, different lives. So you have a lot of diversity in format, in author, in genre, tone. So you have so many options to choose from as a YA reader today, which I think is fantastic. And that is my spiel about the brief history of YA literature, uh, which maybe you didn't think was brief, but I hope was still helpful either way. Thank you guys for watching and have a good day.